I grew up in the U.S. in a little town called Wayland, Massachusetts. It's 30 minutes outside of Boston. And it was a town with very few Asians. So I was very much a minority. Everybody in the town was either Irish or Italian. And all of their parents knew each other. And they're part of this very tight-knit community. They were all Catholic as well, as most Irish and most Italian folks are. And they went to one of two Catholic churches in the town. And I, being Korean American, we went to a Korean church that was 30 minutes outside of the town. So we were very much outside of the community. That meant that I wasn't invited to the parties. I didn't know what clothes were cool to wear when everyone was wearing jams. My mom was sewing my clothes. I, I just was very much an outsider and very much not accepted into the community and respected and affirmed and all that. So I wanted that really badly. I just wanted to be part of the gang. And I really wasn't. And so by the time I was 10, I started to have suicidal thoughts. I just thinking like, hey, you know, if I just went away and kill myself and disappear, then they would be sorry that they were treating me that way. And I got bullied verbally, emotionally, and, and physically. So yeah, that, that was kind of the environment that I grew up in until I was basically a teenager. And how did you transition from all that to a life of, I suppose you could say, quote unquote, crime, because you were like shoplifting and dealing with drugs. There was once you said you shoplifted CDs from Harvard Cook Bookstore, and then you later sent a check to say you're sorry for that. I mean, I think like most places, kids go through rebellion. But the funny thing about the States is when you go through a rebellion for not everyone, but pretty much everyone, like the broad swath of your peers, the more you rebel, the more accepted you are, the more cool you are. And so I started to rebel, like, I mean, like everybody else did, but uh, I just realized that, hey, all of a sudden, everybody started to accept me more and respect me more. And they went from saying things like, oh, you know, John Kim, he's half woman, half man, like he's such a girl, that sort of thing to wow, that guy's got balls, man. He's willing to do stuff I'm not willing to do. And I thought, wow, this is really easy. So I just kind of doubled down on that strategy, head over heels into rebellion. And I was a very, very good kid. I mean, up until that point, I was super submissive and obedient and really like an ideal child in many ways, I think. But yeah, I went from that to stealing CDs, cars. I started doing a lot of partying, drinking for cigarettes, and then a lot of drugs. Started dealing drugs actually bought eventually my first car with drug money and then eventually my first house with drug money. So it wasn't just kind of selling to friends. It was a pretty decent sized operation, I guess. And yeah, what was really deep into this kind of rebellion. And for me, that was, you know, the reason for all that again, was just to gain that affirmation and respect of people, not just the money, but I guess when you walk into a party that age, let's say, let's go get some beers and find a place to hang out. So if you're the guy who makes the fake IDs, which I did, and then is, is willing to drive without a license and pick up your friends, which I did, and you can go buy the alcohol, which I did, and find the drugs, which I did, then you became the life of the party, right? Everybody wanted to hang out with you. So all of a sudden, it was just this totally reverse dynamic. And I guess I found, in a way, what I had been searching for, or I thought I found what I'd been searching for my entire life. Did you feel that you found that affirmation that was exactly what you're looking for? Well, yeah, I did, but I got to say it was a lot of ups and downs. So I always felt it was great to be liked, but then I kind of started to realize that people didn't really like me. They didn't like me for who I was. They liked me for what I could do for them. And I actually had multiple sort of episodes where I kind of lost faith in people in many ways. It sort of culminated in my senior year in college. I had applied early decision to UPenn and Early decision means if you get in, then you have to go. You can't go somewhere else. So I got in. It was this program. It was an engineering and business program, which I really wanted to get into. It's called Jerome Fisher. And, and I got in and I was like, I, I need to go there anyway. And it's my ideal program. So I wasn't going to apply anywhere else. But then I had a really, really bad case of senioritis. So I went from getting A's and B's to like D's and F's. I got a mail from Dean Stetson, Willis Stetson. I still remember his name, the Dean of Admissions at Penn saying, we just got a copy of your final transcript. Your admission to Penn has now been revoked. And sorry, you can't come here anymore. And I was just devastated because obviously any family, but especially Asian family, and your whole life is geared towards going to college and your life is over. If you can't go to college and you would have to do a gap year. And then of course, all the schools the next year would ask you why and tell them and then get your transcript, you know, so my life was over effectively. They did write in the letter, 
if you want, you can try and explain to us why you did so poorly, pending that we, we might let you back in. So I wrote them a letter. And, and what I wrote them was that I had lost faith in humanity over the course of my senior year. And I kind of told the narrative and it was all true, but I sort of slightly exaggerated it and made it sort of all culminated in my senior year, I guess you could say. But basically I said, the only person I felt who could understand me was this Russian composer named Shostakovich. And Shostakovich is a guy, he had written an opera called Lady Macbeth of Minsk, which was kind of like denigrating towards the Stalinist regime. And Stalin killed a bunch of his family, a bunch of his other family members died. And he said, the next piece that you write, it has to be glorifying the Iron Curtain. And if you don't, then I'm going to kill you, basically, is, is kind of what he faced. So he wrote this Fifth Symphony, which we played in my orchestra at the New England Conservatory my senior year. And on the surface, there's this like glorious, very triumphant, victorious themes throughout it. But then if you listen deeply, there's just a very, very, very deep and dark, depressed melancholy. And that's what I felt like my life was because all of a sudden, you know, I was this popular kid all of a sudden. Everyone wanted to hang out with me. I had everything that I could ever hope for. But really deep down, I realized like, hey, these people actually don't really care about me. They just want to be able to hang out with somebody who can make them fake IDs and get drinks and drugs and pick them up with a car and yada, yada. And so I developed a bit of a defense mechanism, I guess you could say, against people. And actually, my dad has a similar mechanism for slightly different reasons, but I'm kind of like had a lot of acquaintances, but very, very few kind of true deep friends for most of my life, I would say, actually. So did I achieve what I wanted? In a sense, yes, I was the life of the party. People wanted to hang out with me. People respected me, affirmed me, all that stuff. But I realized that that's a really double-edged sword. I wrote the letter. They got the letter. My mother called Dean Stetson and said, hey, we just wanted you to know that we read the letter as well. And we support John and everything in there is true and so on. And, and he said, oh yeah, don't worry about it. We read his letter and we're very convinced he's going to be just fine here. So they let me back in. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> So I went there and it was more the same. But the thing is, I didn't have to deal with the baggage of the past. I think when I got there and I was a pretty likable guy, I guess. And again, for the cohort of people who liked the party and things like that, I was the life of the party in some senses. And another manifestation, I think, of all of that was music. Music has been something that's very central in my life. I got into playing in bands in high school as well. In college, I started a few bands, and one of them I ended up playing professionally with for some time, and we toured around the U.S. And at our peak, I think our largest show, we played for an audience of a few thousand people at this venue called the Electric Factory. So I think a lot of my motivation for playing music had to do with that same thread, which was when you have thousands of people or even like tens of people. My first shows were at this little tiny bar on New Penn campus called Smokey Joe's. I think it fit like a hundred people or something. But when that place is packed and they're cheering for you, you feel like, wow, so accepted, so affirmed, so respected. You know, but what I realized is like with each greater shot of affirmation that you get from something like that, there's a lower low that comes afterwards. I was also a psychology minor. And so I kind of realized what's happening for people who are searching after things like money or acceptance, relationships or sex or whatever, these outside manifestations of things in the world. But really what's driving that behavior is a little squirt of dopamine or some neurotransmitter in your brain. So you get a little bit of it and you're like, it feels good. So you're like, oh, I want more of that. So then, you know, you go after that same behavior and the same behavior. But the thing is we're adaptive mechanisms. So in the sense that you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, when I was into a thing at one point, I was reading his encyclopedia of bodybuilding and he said something really interesting, which is if you put a five horsepower load on a three horsepower motor, it breaks. But if you put a five horsepower load on a three horsepower person, you know, it becomes a five horsepower person. And so we're adaptive mechanisms. That's, that's a beautiful thing because it means we can get stronger, we can learn, we can get smarter. But on the flip side, whatever shot of dopamine that you got the last time, let's say you earned a dollar and you get the squirt of dopamine, the next time, if you earn a dollar, it's not going to be the same squirt of dopamine. You need to earn a dollar fifty, or and then two dollars, and then five dollars, and so on. I just realized, like, actually, what I'm searching after is so meaningless. This thing that I'd wanted my whole life, and I was kind of starting to get it. I was like, this is totally, totally pointless. And so I actually started to get really, really depressed in the midst of all of that. There was one show in particular where I was looking out at the crowd, and I heard this voice. This voice said, "Come home." And I kind of like looked around. I was like, what the heck is that? And I wasn't sure if anybody else had heard it or anything. And they hadn't. First of all, I was very confused because like, what is home for me? I grew up in the Boston area. I moved to Philadelphia for, for school. By this point, I was playing in a band full time. So we're traveling around the country, literally living out of hotel rooms, very, very homeless in a sense. My parents had moved away from Boston to Korea by that point. So I didn't have family in Boston anymore. 
in Korea was definitely not my home. Not only that, but the three reasons that I blamed for getting bullied originally were the fact that I was Korean, because that's why I was not part of the community. The fact that I had a different faith, like I was a Protestant versus a Catholic. I mean, they're pretty similar, but you know, that's another reason why I was different from everybody. And that's why I went to this church that was so far away. And then the third thing was just that my parents, they were who they were, and they were immigrants, and they didn't know. And so I wanted nothing to do with Korea. I wanted nothing to do with my parents. I wanted nothing to do with my faith for a long time. But when I heard this voice, I realized that home wasn't a physical place, it was a state of mind. And it was actually those three things which I just thrown away for these 10 years when I went into that period of very deep rebellion. After that, I moved to Korea and I lived with my parents. I reconciled with them. I had really been very far from them for those years in between. I started learning the language. I started getting to know Korean folks, started making Korean friends, dating Korean girls. And then I eventually started working there and I started going to church again. And so I kind of slowly started to find my faith and, and reconcile with all of those elements of my past. You did internships with IDG, which is the largest technology publisher in the, in the world. And that inspired you to start your first company, the Y Group. How did yeah. that happen? Yeah, I just threw my resume up online. It was not nearly as common as it is now to throw your resume up online. It was much more campus recruiting through your own personal networks or whatever. And it ended up, there was a guy named Stu Needles who found my resume and IDG, so as you mentioned, the largest tech publisher in the world, I think still today, at the time they own 50 plus magazines, Macworld, PC World, CIO Magazine, so on. They do all the dummies books, so like HTML for dummies, Wine for dummies, all that, they own all that stuff. They had published a number of articles across all of their magazines talking about the parallel between and the relationship between computer science and other repetitive structural areas of thought, things like architecture or, or math, recursive loops that go over and over again. And music is, is one that's very, very common. Same thing. Music, if you think about it, it's all numbers. Frequencies, it's all numbers. Rhythm, it's all numbers. You loop certain parts of a piece over and over again. Those are like for loops or while loops in computer programming. And so he had just read these series of articles. So he just went online and did this random search of who is in this database that has a music background and who is a freshman or whatever, sophomore in college and might be from around the area. And it ends up their headquarters is actually the next town over from where I grew up. It's not a big town. So then he found my resume. He pinged me and I ended up going in and, and getting the internship and I reported to him and then directly to the CIO eventually. And it was amazing, amazing experience to do that. Very, I guess, lucky, or, you know, I think there was something divine maybe in that. It's, it's happened in various threads of my career, I think. But in terms of the actual experience, because they had all these different CEOs of their subsidiaries, they wanted to be able to search a database saying, hey, what's ad revenue in my magazine or maybe across magazines, or let's slice it up by advertiser, what sector they're in or geography or all, this, all these sorts of things. And that's just a database query. But until then, database queries were actually all taking place either offline or maybe in an intranet. It wasn't really possible through web until like right around that time. This is like 96, 97, I think. And so we were building that and I saw oh, this is a really interesting technology to be able to search databases online. Until then, every website was kind of static. It was like the same thing every time you looked at it. I thought maybe this would be fun to use this to solve a pain point that I had. Again, I love music. So I'm always trying to figure out what cool music show is taking place. And I thought maybe you could search it by city or by genre or by band or by whatever. And uh, so I started to build this thing at night. I, I called some friends from school, from Penn, and then we started building it after the internship. And we came back to, to school and we continued to build it. And then we realized like, hey, actually a lot of the bands and the venues and the so on that we want to list, they don't have their own website and they're willing to pay for it because they know this is the future. So they, they started asking us to make that. So we started doing this consulting work and then, you know, it's good money. So we're like, we're happy to do that. And then we, we realized, well, we like live music events anyway. And then if we're, we have these relationships, why not just throw some parties? Because we like to party anyway. So we did that. And then I went to our kind of an advisor. He's the guy who started the Jerome Fisher m and program that I went to. His name is uh, Bill Hamilton. And he's on the board of some very, very big companies and has advised numbers of startups as well. And he's, he just basically told me something which is now very obvious. And I think because the internet, most entrepreneurs should know this, but you got to focus on one thing. You need to have a beachhead. You need to scale in one specific area first, and then you can kind of layer on different products or different you know, offerings. And so he told me that and I said, oh, okay, we should probably split this thing up. So the e-consulting business was earning the most money, immediate cash flow. I was like, oh, I think I'll just take that. And then I let some friends take the other two businesses. The, the other one, the original idea ended up becoming part of City Search. And so I think probably a much better ultimate outcome for those guys. 
another lesson I think I learned out of that was it's really important to have a very long-term perspective instead of thinking with sort of short-term blinders on. But yeah, that's how that happened. And that's how we ended up starting the company. It sounds like you were doing pretty well. So why did you decide to follow it after a couple of years and move on? I guess I always kind of knew that there had to be something greater. Like everything I just said about being accepted and so forth. I mean, I think in the undercurrent of that, I knew that there was something greater. I mean, I, I grew up in this household where faith was very important. And so even though I kind of succumbed to my worldly desires and so forth, I kind of knew in my head that there's always got to be something more somehow. In this particular case, the mission for me was just about getting the music to the people and getting the people to the music. And then when it sort of lost that, e-consulting, you can make websites and systems for bands and venues and record labels and so forth. But if you really want to just do that, it doesn't make sense. So we ended up doing e-commerce. I'm going to like much bigger companies and money was much better. Margins were much better. We could scale the team, all that, but it lost its music focus. And then somehow it just didn't feel right anymore. It wasn't about the original mission. So I sold my shares back to the partners and then I, I moved on from there. And you got to remember, we did take some time off school, but this was all kind of like during school for the most part. So you end up going to Merck, then you went to the Alley and you were there for three years. So how did you begin to build that rock band? So I actually started the band before graduating and it was very organic. I mean, I don't want to say I started the band. It was a bunch of us that started together. We had a few different turns of, of folks, but we started doing some shows before graduating. Upon graduating, I wasn't ready to do it full time. So I was in enterprise IT at Merck, a big pharmaceutical company. That was a great experience too. We were gigging on nights and weekends with a full-time job. And it just really wasn't sustainable. And so as we were seeing more and more traction with the band, we said, let's take this full time. Let's go on tour, put out some records and so forth. And so we did that and we started the Ally, kept at it for a while. And it was fun. It was a great experience. I think all of my bandmates are still playing music professionally, quite successfully, I would say. One is he's got a band. I think they were signed to, to Sony not that long ago, but he also does commercial music. that has been on the Super Bowl and all these things. He's got a business doing that. Another... One of the bandmates, he started a band called Yaysayer. They went on tour with Radiohead and Beck and a bunch of people. So played on The Tonight Show. And then there's another, our drummer, Mike, is in a couple bands, actually. I think he plays with the Disco Biscuits and Lotus. They're playing out stadiums around the U.S. and stuff. So yeah, they've all kept with music. I'm very proud of all of them. And uh, yeah, it feels like several lifetimes ago, but it was a great experience. I imagine one of your highlights was getting the platinum record for contributing to Brandy's album. How was that? What was the experience like? It was great. So what happened was we were recording the Ally, our band, we were recording our album at this place called The Studio. It's a very original name, but it was kind of a JV between this guy named Larry Gold, who is actually a cellist originally, Jewish guy, long ponytail, trained classically, but he was just really in love with soul music. So like he, he was doing strings arrangements and producing and stuff for Motown from like the 60s all the way through. It was JV between him and The Roots. We were there recording and they have on their wall just like lined with platinum records. And so I was in a corner warming up before my session and this African-American gentleman, bigger guy comes over and he's kind of like checking me out and I see him out of the corner of my eye. And apparently before that, he had gone to my bass player and, and, and drum, my, my bandmates basically. And, and he said, oh, who that playing the violin? And they're like, oh yeah, that's John Johan Kimbo. He just came fresh out the boat from Korea. He don't speak any English. And he was like, no way, that's crazy. So he walked over and he was just kind of like checking me out. And I saw him out of the corner of my eye and I turned around and I was like, hey man, what's going on? I'm Kimbo. And I gave him like a big high five and he jumped. I've never seen such a big man jump so far. <laughs> he jumped so far back. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, my name's Rodney. And he's, he's like, you want to play on a record sometime? I was like, yeah, I'll play on a record. Am I going to get a credit? He's like, yeah, you get a credit. Don't worry. And then he walked away and one of the guys from the studio came up to me and said, hey, do you know who that is? And I said, no. He's like, Rodney? But yeah, that's Rodney Jerkins. He's like the top producer in the world right now. He's knocking him, himself out of number one, like every single number one single. He just finished with Michael Jackson, Aaliyah, Spice Girls, Britney Spears, like anybody, J-Lo, Will Smith. You can imagine he's been producing them. So he ended up pulling me into the Brandy record. It was great, man. Some people you just know when they're so on top of their craft. I mean, it was literally like I walked into the session and it was like, there were like musical notes just oozing out of every pore of this man's body. I mean, it was crazy. He would just be like, yeah, play, play this. And then he'd just say something. He'd sing like a little lick and then I, I'd play it back. And being classically trained, there's certain ways that scales are. And he would sing it. And I would think that he sang it in error in a way, but then he'd be like, no, 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 that's not what I meant. He meant like this. And he intentionally is just a little bit outside the box. Not so much that it sounds 
crazy and distorted, but enough so it's like fresh. So everything new is like a new sound. And that's why he's just such an amazing producer. So that was uh, that experience. And I got to say, there were a couple misses in a way too. So just before that, what had happened was Jay-Z was recording his Unplugged album. I'm a huge fan of Jay-Z. I mean, I love Brandy, don't get me wrong, but like Jay-Z for me is just like, I mean, there's no comparison. So he was recording in New York, his Unplugged album, and the Roots were doing the backup and Larry Gold was doing the string. So he's putting a quartet together. He had this raspy voice. I'd be like, hey, hey, Larry, can you pull me in that record? I'd love to get on that record. And he's like, yeah, yeah, Kimbo, I'll get you on that record. No problem. I was like, yeah, yeah, awesome, awesome. And then I didn't hear from the guy. What happened was apparently he was in New York when I pinged him and he came back. He said, oh, I'm so sorry, Kimbo, I forgot. And I was like, oh my good, Larry, this is like my life's dream. I would have killed myself to just be able to do this. I mean, I would have loved to play on that record. That would, But we got to be thankful for what happened. I guess if I can just share one more music story from around that era. So this was all like kind of when we were at school at Penn. And the other guy at Penn who had a platinum record was this guy named John Stevens. And John Stevens... He played the piano and he sang an acapella group and he gigged around like solo here and there. And I, I sang an acapella group too. And I'd see him around and we did some shows together and things. I'd see him and kind of just joke around and like, yeah, you ain't got no talent. Come on, man. And, and all that stuff. And I mean, he's very, very talented, but anyways, he, he played on the Miseducation of Lauren Hill, a little bit of piano. Lauren Hill's from Fuji's, someone I admire a lot, love, love her music. So that went platinum, won a Grammy. And then the next year I got to do this thing with Brandy that went platinum, won a Grammy. So we're the two guys on campus with Platinum Records, and he graduated a year before me. He went to New York, and then he was a consultant at BCG, but he still played music, kind of like me. He had his job, but he played music on nights and weekends in like dingy little bars in New York. And at one of these dingy little bars, his roommate from Penn, who is Kanye West's cousin, brought Kanye to his show. And apparently Kanye was like, hey, man, what are you doing? Like consulting. You should be playing music. You're really good. And he's like, yeah, well, nobody wants to sign me. So, so sign me. He's like, all right, I'll sign you. So he signed him and he brought him on tour with himself and Usher. And he changed his last name to Legend. So this is John Legend we're talking about. And I don't know, he won like five Grammys that year and became John Legend. So moral of the story is if I had changed my last name to Legend, I would have been John Legend because we're the two guys, on, we're the two Johns on campus with Platinum Records. No, I mean, like really, really talented, obviously like really, really, really talented dude. And just, uh, yeah, so thankful to have had any brush in with him in a past life. But yeah, music's, uh, music's, it's just so divine, right? It's an incredible way to get to know people uh, and to connect with something that's just so much greater than yourself. It's just so interesting to me that these opportunities come almost by luck. As though you just have to be at the right place with the right people and these all come together. I mean, like I grew up, you know, with classical and then I played like Hillsong at church and I went to London and I joined an African-Caribbean church. These musicians had never had a single proper lesson before. So the chords they play are so out of this world. So it was a bit of an adjustment for me to figure out how to play with them. So did you have that moment of adjustment and figure out where you were? Yeah, I guess it was incremental in a sense. I started with violin when I was seven. And then at nine, I picked up the saxophone. But it's like very simple saxophone you do in school. But you kind of get exposed a little bit to like jazz music and funk and these sorts of things. But really, I mean, it was very surface level. Really, when I was, I think in maybe eighth or ninth grade, 14-ish, I got really into Dave Matthews Band. And Dave Matthews Band, they had this electric violinist named Boyd Tinsley, who was incredible as a violinist, but just like really stylish. He's also African-American, like very fiddler type of guy. Like he definitely didn't use classical technique, let's just put it that way, but had so much soul I ended up later actually getting sponsored by the same violin company that sponsors him. It's called Zeta. It was just such an honor for me. He got a much better deal. He got lots of free stuff. And I think I got a little discount or something, but that was my first foray to like, Hey, wow, you can use the violin. And it was kind of bluegrass influenced rock and roll music, basically. So you could kind of use the violin in a more fiddle-esque type of way. And then there was this fiddle camp, actually. There's a guy named Mark O'Connor who was actually also sponsored by the same violin company. I think by the time he was nine, he grew up in bluegrass, like country music sort of scene. By the time he was nine or 10, he had won every single competition in that whole thing, like in the world or something. And so then he, he kind of started going and conquering other genres one by one. So he did a classical album with Yo-Yo Ma. He did a jazz album with Wynton Marsalis and just amazing. So he has this fiddle camp in Nashville. Like it's a little bit outside Nashville. And so he's got all sorts of people coming from all around the world and all the best teachers are like the best jazz violinists you could think of, the best classical violinists you could think of and bluegrass, like Irish Celtic and Nova Scotian, whatever. And so you just go 
going there and just jamming and learning all this different types of music. And they're like these improvisational, whatever circles, like just hoedowns basically that take place until way into the night. So I guess it was incremental. Like I learned, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. At school, there was a jazz improvisation class where they were very shocked. Guthrie Ramsey is the professor's name. He had never seen a, a violinist come for his jazz class. But yeah, I guess each time it was a little more exposure for me. And that's what I love. I love my orchestra conductor in high school at Anunga Conservatory, the sort of the youth program. His, his name was Benjamin Zander. Incredibly inspirational guy. One of the really big influences, I think, in my life and my thinking. But he, he did, had this exercise one time. He basically said, like, we're about to go to a retreat. So we're about to get on a bus and then go across the Boston Harbor on a boat and then eventually go to this island and be there for three days doing stuff. And so he said, I want each of you on this trip going over there to do something that you wouldn't normally do. And from there, we're going to share about it. So we all take the trip and then we go there and we sit down in our positions in the orchestra uh, and he says, okay, so everyone share. So then somebody gets up and says, oh yeah, I punched somebody. I'm really not violent, but I actually punched somebody. And then said, I did a cartwheel. Like I'm really usually very so safe and like always buckling my seatbelt, but I actually did a cartwheel on the bus while it was moving. And then all these people are sharing like stuff that they never done before, but they did on this trip. And then he said, I just wanted to use this exercise to illustrate that we as people, we have a place where we stop. We have a boundary that things inside there are things that we do and things outside there are things that we don't do. And the process for us to become more ourselves is to expand that boundary out a little bit more. And that's what growth is really ultimately. And then he had us actually get up out of our seats and then move somewhere else. So the whole orchestra was mixed up in totally different places. And then we played the same piece that we've been playing for months and months and months. But all of a sudden, like the flute was actually on the left now and the cellos had always been on the left, but it's actually in front of you now. You're experiencing the, the same piece, but in a totally different way. And it becomes so, so much more live and so much more real and experienced from a different perspective. But then when we got back together, we could understand it in a different way and bring that depth to it that we couldn't before having just experienced in a very unidimensional way before that. So I think that this process of expanding my boundary and also helping other people to expand that boundary is something that, yeah, is very kind of core to what I believe is I'm about and I think growth is all about. Why do you decide to leave the alley since this was something that you clearly love so much? Yeah, I did. I loved it. But then that was sort of the peak of the rebellion years in a sense. That was the peak of the dealing drugs, the doing drugs. I mean, there were groupies, you know, it's traveling around. There's lots of highs and like engineered highs and then lots of crashes afterwards. And then, yeah, so there was that moment where I heard I think now I, I process it as God's voice saying, come home. And I realized like, yeah, this chasing the next quarter dopamine is not really what my life is about. That's why I kind of decided to head back to my roots. And so that's why I left the band. What's interesting for me is that you had that moment when you want to find yourself. I imagine most people wouldn't decide to go straight to Goldman Sachs, really just yeah. working nonstop. I think you were what? going out, drinking into 3 a.m. and backing off at 7 a.m. I mean, that was an insane pace. So how did you end up in Goldman Sachs? So actually, before Goldman, I went to a hedge fund in uh, Korea. And this is, again, like the zigzags. So when we were on tour in Chicago, we stayed with my friend and lighting director for the band's uncle. And I got along well with him. I had actually, never forget, I, I knocked on his door when we arrived at his house, we're still close friends. And I think he's got five kids. And so the youngest one opened the, the door and she kind of looked up at me. I used to dress very eccentrically though. I had a pink fuzzy hat, furry jacket. I think it had feathers sticking out of it or something. Leather, red bell bottoms and blue suede shoes. And so she just took one look at me and she's like, what the heck is this animal or whatever? <laughs> she just found me very curious. Anyway, so, so we go in and then we, we went up to our room upstairs and that happened to be where their toys are. So they knocked their door and said, yeah, come in, come in. And they came in and they started playing with their dolls. So I went over to them and I, I took, you know, a Barbie doll and I took another Barbie doll and I started playing with them. And, and then they ran downstairs and they said, mommy, daddy, Kimbo plays with dolls. And then they said, they said, no, come on, stop bothering him. He he so, must be so tired. Let him rest. And they said, no, no, he really likes it. So, you know, I would send Christmas cards for many years that had like a stick figure with a pink hat and Kimbo plays with dolls is the tagline. But anyway, somehow I just got along with them and I decided to go home and, and get to Korea so the uncle was telling his neighbor about me and, and I guess the neighbor said, he was the president of this hedge fund that had an, an office in Korea. And he said, oh, he sounds interesting. Tell him to give me a buzz if he wants to work. 
And I, I had thought that I would want to go and go to school, actually. Both my parents are professors. I think they would deny it now, but I think they've at least originally harbored a lot of hope that I would eventually become an academic of some sort, or at least get a PhD. I think their standards went down over the years, or at least get a master's, at least get an MBA. They've totally given up at this point. But yeah, I think I said it's a very long shot, but I'm going to shoot for an honorary doctorate. So it's not completely over <laughs> at this point. So yeah, I guess there was this stop in between going to the fund in Korea. And so I was trading derivatives there very randomly. And so I did that for four years. And then this position opened up at Goldman. And then I moved there and it was trading something actually very different, commodities. And I did that for five years. Yeah. And that's what brought me to Singapore. I like to say I, I came to Singapore for work. I married a Singaporean, so I stayed for love. We have three kids and, and now I'm stuck, <laughs> but it's okay. There are worse places in the world to be stuck. 